Okay, Dana, I'm wondering why no comedians na have their book named Always On. Right, because almost all comedians are not are, always on. They're but off. Buddy Hackett would cry himself to sleep every night. Sid Caesar would go to the beach and go, should I swim out, boys? No, comedians <laughs> Does have Does that a, mean kill himself? Yeah. yeah. Comedians have a, a darn, the ones that are always on cry themselves to sleep. Let's put it that way. We do have a rap, we comedians, as being like sad sacks and like obviously damaged, but it's, it's, I hate it. It's sort of a running theme. It's not, not true. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, you know, having a rough childhood, maybe being on the kind of a little kid in school, you get a, a big old chip. Having a chip on your shoulder is good for the arts. Yeah. I'll show you motherfuckers. Well, there's a couple that come to <laughs> mind that are very <laughs> like internal in real life, but I have to say you at least, I like to hang out with the ones where I don't have to extract the comedy from them. <laughs> like you're just very sort of the way you are anyway. I think I'm like that. And uh, I like that easier than like pulling teeth to get someone to say something, a modicum of humor. It's, oh it's very interesting, the relaxation and confidence. Like what is it kind of about? Like if you walk in a room and it's like, say it's Lauren and Steve Martin and Alec Baldwin, and maybe just throw in Obama and you take a chair, you know. Obama's like you, in there? No, I'm putting a, a, a table okay. that might intimidate yeah. you. And then how much can you be yourself? No, David? it is hard. But sometimes I turn nervousness, I I, I goose it up and I, I'm jokes, extra yeah. clowny. It's it's really well, sick. Dave, David Spade, um, was that as good as it gets? Or what was the name of that TV show? I thought you were the funniest guy in it. Lauren goes like this, you know David Spade. And then they all look and I go, beep, bop, boop. I just go right in. You go right in. I don't even go, hey, man. I go like this. I go, isn't that special? <laughs> I want the ball. You are. Dana, calm down. We don't need it. <laughs> Pull just, my string. Just, just, be, be, just, be, just be, Michelle, be yourself. Alec Baldwin, <laughs> I'm excited about. <laughs> Alec was in the room you just uh, mentioned, that uh, fi at, fictitious at, room. At the fictitious, <laughs> scary room. Alec Baldwin is is a force of nature, man. He is uh, a very, you know, he played football in high school. He's, he's, he's a big guy. He, he, he's built strong. He's one of 37 brothers. I know Billy Baldwin. I know Daniel Baldwin. There's yeah. Stephen Baldwin. Yeah. And there's... Uh, if you go Baldwin to the Baldwin. town they grew up in and you just meet people at the store, I'm a Baldwin too. I'm a Baldwin. I know a Baldwin. <laughs> when I, I, when I, when I open my show, I go, any Baldwins here? A couple in the back? Um, Alec Baldwin. So we're really happy to have had him on the podcast because he has his own lane. I love that phrase. Mm -hmm. You have your own lane. I have my own lane. With his history of Saturday Night Live, going from movie stardom and loving Saturday Night Live and hosting it 17 times. He has the record. And then many guest appearances, just regular cameos he did. Mm -hmm. And then he also did Trump for four years. We thought he's like, I I like this word, a de facto cast member. He has mm -hmm. a huge history with SNL. And we wanted to break that down. I'm also fascinated by the Baldwin brothers and where they came from and how, mm -hmm. how do you have four sons like that? They're all kind of cool looking and they have really cool voices. I'd like to meet the dad. Yeah, my kids are fine. I don't know where they came from. You know, genetics is strong. <laughs> Am I doing this? <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> Alec and everyone's like, hey, listen, here's how it's going. Uh, Alec Baldwin has the best voice. Yeah, he's cool. Hey, uh, he was my third show, Dana. How many shows were you on with him, do you think? I think he hosted at least twice. It seemed like he was in the studio a lot, too, yeah. doing guest spots. So he was just around. And he will talk all about how he made that pivot from he still is a movie star but he really really loves sketch comedy he said i want to do this yeah and he ended up being brilliant at it so he, he was Tony in Bennett beetlejuice on. he was in uh glenn gary uh glenn campbell oh, yeah. what was that one yeah <laughs> uh, i am the bald one from the county, county. And I make <laughs> he was doing the hunt for red october when he hosted and that's what he was yes. uh, he was promoting that or miami blues or something but it was great to he, meet him yeah and and watch him just uh, be better than me immediately as a as a sketch player. <laughs> I know his Tony Bennett is amazing. Yeah, he, as Lauren would say, he knows how to land a laugh. You know, he knows his way around that. that Did I even comb my hair today? It's called a I hat, didn't? David. There's four right there. God damn it! Just don't just punt on it. 
you know, just let it go. I just put Heather, this Heather, get on. my comb. Look, I'm not going to show this It's in the anybody. comb room. Kids would cry and scream floor. and run away. Why, Daddy? Why is oh, his yeah. hair like that, Daddy? God damn, yours is maybe worse, but you have a hat, smartly. Well, well you know, I work out and I sweat. It's a long story. I don't want to go into it now. Listen, Jesus David. Christ, I did the whole thing like that? <laughs> Listen, David. Heather, get the 12-way mirror. Yeah, get this the special like this. spritz. Beep, 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 get the special <laughs> spritz, and I can tease that up. I know it's maybe inappropriate. Only me and uh, James Cameron have one. He practices Avatar, and it. Beep, 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 I don't like to see myself from the side. <laughs> I mean, how do you practice? I don't even see how they all look from every angle. And they're like, I don't know what I'm saying. They're in all the right. water. Well, we had a very <laughs> a lot of interesting things were said today. So, yeah, tune this one. In. Uh, Alec is not shy about having an opinion about yeah. everything in life. He's very interesting to talk to. Uh, and it was great to revisit all the Saturday Night Live stuff, all his great movies. He's quite a talent, an American original. And it was so much fun talking to him. I, I would listen to this one yeah. if I were me. To sum it up, I've been to Aspen. <laughs> it says on my shirt. Why are you, what are you getting for that? $100? Mm -hmm. You are you? I work for I work for Aspen. Yeah. Uh, now I just like to let the world know. Aspen, like, you add an H to that. That's <laughs> that's, that's stinking thinking. I've been to you're Aspen, good Colorado. enough. You're strong enough, and gosh darn it, people. That's like, like a you. roast joke. I think I saw you in Hasbin. <laughs> What's the name of your special again? Personal lives. What is it? Uh, nothing personal. Oh, nothing personal. Was uh, yeah. So anyway, Alec Baldwin, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Here he is. I feel like I died and went to comedy purgatory here. This is great. It's heaven. Comedy purgatory. No, okay. okay. <laughs> well, it's I think we're, we're at, the jury's out. The jury's out. Yes, we, we shall see. We shall see. But it is yeah, good it to see you. might be by the end of this show. You too, good to see you. Yes. Good to see you, Alec. Um, you too. All right. I've been listening to the show, and I, uh, um, I listen to the show. When you guys do the promos at the beginning, Spain, you're very good. You're a very good pitch man. Oh, yeah? You're a one. You're, your voice is clear. You have the right emphasis. You're you're a born salesman. Oh fuck yeah! Man. I have told him that from the beginning. He thought I was kidding. Like he has a voice, and it really cuts through. That's why I let him do most. He of the does. Exposition. He does. He should just stay away. From, he should just stay away from hair products. That's what he should stay. <laughs> fuck. Don't even look at my hair today. It's really. I can't. I can't. Your hair is like a boating accident. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong. It's like fiberglass shards <laughs> sticking out. It's like well, a spider web. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I was jealous. I was jealous of Alec Baldwin's hair um, pretty much from the get-go. Alec, I was just looking online to see, first of all, who you were. And secondly, what? Um, what? Ho I, I think you were my th third show. I was a writer, and it was your first show. And so it was either... It was either my third show. I think the second one was Dice Clay, and I think you were third. Do you remember this? Does that make any sense? I just remember when I met you, I was terrified. When I met you, I was terrified. Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, because okay. you come, you you come from that school of um, like Letterman and other people who are. If you get into the comedy uh, thing, it's like log rolling. Oh. If you try to be sharper than them or as funny as them, or you try to like battle wits with them. You know who's going in the water. I'm going in the water. Oh, that's <laughs> nice of you to say. And you're so and you're so clever. Like Dana is uh, warm and and uh, and and kind of uh, does all these silly characters. Yeah. And Spade, you you terrified me. Whatever you would walk in, I would like stiffen. No, that's so, <laughs> wow. Well, he's going to he's going to dine out on he's going to dine yeah. out on. I that. thought he's I thought I'm going in the water today. Well, yeah. they see right. He's like a combination. Of, he's got some Dennis in him. That sort mm -hmm. of wit and cunning. Dennis, he can Letterman. From love, Ellen DeGeneres, yeah, Ellen yeah. DeGeneres, um, so. Yeah, it is true. I am, uh, I am, yeah. I, I agree. Thank you, Alec. I, I, when you came to host, I was very nervous just because. First of all, honestly, you weren't the biggest star there because you were starting out. But we had just seen Hunt for Red October. They also uh, sequestered the writers to see a new product from the host, and that was, I think, Miami Blues. All right. And we watched that, and so. You just could tell, I've said on other podcasts, you knew Alec was a star. You walk into that meeting, I think you had a black turtleneck, good looking, good hair, which I'm furious Incredible about. hair. <laughs> yeah. And Love then hair. good voice, just too much going on, angered me. And then um, 
very cool. <laughs> like the you show. attacked. Yeah, you it attacked. Was, yeah, I really lay down on that one. Attacked. Well, in the first week, I never said this before. Uh, Victoria Jackson. Then the oh, second yeah. time you hosted, I've never said it to Alex. She said, "I'm I'm not going to do it this week. I'm not going to do it this week." And I said, "Well, what are you talking about? I'm not going to fall in love with him." Yeah. Speaking of you, and then by no, Friday, what's funny? Yeah. Go ahead. But by Friday, she said. He looked at me with those blue eyes. I yeah. fell in love again. <laughs> so, <laughs> she, she didn't realize. She didn't realize I'd already fallen in love with Hartman. I wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The great. Yeah. But you know what's funny is, as you know, is that when I first came on, you have to make a decision, or you have to you have to recognize something, which is either you come on, and your career is so iconic, like Stallone or Schwarzenegger, where they're going to make fun of you as you, mm -hmm. or. You do your best, I mean, with varying degrees of success to just become a member of the company and do the sketches. And it's not really about you and sending you up. It's you need to be a part of the group. And so when I came on, that's when I realized that I'm not Schwarzenegger and you can't lampoon my essence. So I just thought I would try to be, uh, you know, one of the gang there. And I always came back. People said, why did you host so many times? I said, because that was really... In the beginning, the heyday of me doing films, I mostly like all the '90s. I did movies. Yeah, and uh, and I said movies are challenging. Movies can be challenging, but they're so fucking boring. It's unbelievable. I mean, you're bored to death. <laughs> and I said I went back to SNL all the time because it was fun. I wanted to have fun, and it was fun. Yeah, I think maybe that comes from him doing plays, Dana, because. Uh, I think, Alec, I've read you really like doing plays, and that's another version of doing a play in a way. You're, you're live, you're with other people, you're playing off everybody. It's happening right then. But now that I have seven children <laughs> between the ages of, of nine and eight months, and eight I'm, I'm going to sign a deal to do uh, a play for like the next 10 years. So I'm going to be gone every night. I'm sorry. I'm in the car at five. I got to be at the theater early. Like, there. You do have a and, bit of a uh, cheaper by the dozen vibe going. Uh, <laughs> it's, crazy. it's crazy. That's good, but you came from six, so it's it's thematic in a sense. Do you come from a big family? Five. You're one of five, and you grew up again. Where did you grow up? Uh, Sausalito. Where are well, you from? from Montana, but then Sausalito. grew up grew up basically on the peninsula, you know, south of San Francisco. Yeah, yeah we I thought were, you were from the Bay Area. Yeah, middle class, stacked kids, two years apart, like the Baldwin boys, pretty much. Or is that, that yeah, you? 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 you I, I guess that kind of because you do have a very four one five. I vibe about it. You're very far on the <laughs> I think you are. You have that vibe. Four on five. I don't like know. Kamala what. Harris. I'm an Kamala Harris is very far on five. <laughs> I'm yeah. laughing like Kamala. But you said here to your point a second ago, when you came on the show, to me you were a, so <laughs> a star already. Yeah. And and but you acted exactly like we have a new cast member this week. And you said to me, because you'd done the big submarine movie, and and I said, you were kind of going, I don't know about these movies, and you go, uh, I uh, I go, what do you want to do? I just met you. We're on the soundstage rehearsing. I want to do this. I like doing this. You think I want to be on a submarine and go, I, I captain for the rest of my life? Fuck yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so well, you the, were, the, 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 yeah. Well, the shit with that is I always to say, oh, I'd love to be in the cast. I'd love to be in the cast. This is the most fun. And then when the Trump thing came and I was in the cast. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. Mean, I, I, I was, yeah. I was in and out in five minutes. I was in and out in the first five minutes. But I was there the first two seasons. I, the first season I did every show. Second season, I did nearly every show. Third season, less than second season, like yeah. half. But like that period I was there, I was like, boy, do I regret wishing that I was in the <laughs> Wish came true. Yeah, well, that's with true. kids on a Saturday night. That is a big, a big deal because it, it gets you on that late schedule. You're gone all day on that Saturday rehearsing. So, yeah, that's, that's a I think, tough I think, one. I think, I think when I finished SNL with Trump thing in 2020, when he lost, I, I still had three less children than I have. Oh, I've had three children since then. So you have a kid every Monday. <laughs> well, do you want to do you speed, do you want to make an announcement, Alex? Speed, <laughs> yeah. speed, speed, speed is like ooh. Now, no, wait. Do 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 either of you have kids? You have kids. Yes, Maybe you have kids. Alex. Two boys. Yeah, I have and speed, one. You have kids. I have one daughter, and I grew up with two brothers. Uh, Dana, you only had brothers too, right? No, I have a uh, baby sister. Older brothers. I don't really even know Dana. De Dennis Miller would be say something like, Christ's sake, so can't get the progeny's increasing at an exponential rate in the Baldwin household. I see. Yeah. And, it's it's yeah. crazy. But it's yeah. It's it's like this is my project. I really mean it. This is the oh, thing. Oh shit. I get a job and I'm like, you know, if it's a week, like come to Vancouver, shoot a movie, 
your character's dead on page five of the movie. I'm like, great, I'm there. Fly, uh, <laughs> Can I do, I do 10 I do weeks? A couple scenes. So yeah, it's kind of like a, a flip. But have you seen so far that the siblings are raising each other? It's a, it's a clan. It's a brood. And there's the mom and the dad. But the siblings, as they go along, are doing a lot of shenanigans and play. I mean, it's, it's a pretty incredible dynamic to watch. Well, we had a girl and then we had four boys in a row. Wow. And then we had two girls. And the boys are, you know, I mean, it's, they're boys, man. So it's like you come in their room and one of them standing there out of the shower going, my penis, my penis, my penis. That's what I do. And, and not only are they singing a song about it, it's a bad song. <laughs> By the way, I think they're still young. They're not really pulling their weight yet, right? They're not doing as many chores and, and uh, babysitting as you'd like. Well, I love the line when you guys were talking with, with Sherry on Terry. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 Spade says, you know, we didn't get cars on the show like you, Dana. You know, your whole you're being carted around like Meghan Markle. <laughs> <laughs> he is our Meghan Markle. Jesus, I love this that. guy. And my That's kids true. and my kids have a little Meghan Markle coming. They're getting carted. Hey, yeah, around. it's hard to stay rich though with so many kids. I have, you know, it's just tough out there because every everyone's uh, in a more spoiled world than we grew up in. Because when I was a kid. You know, I would think, oh, in the summer in Arizona, I bet everyone's having a lot of fun. They drove to San Diego or something. But now with Instagram, you have concrete photographic proof everyone's having more fun than you. It leather like in Ibiza and Italy. I'm like, wait, they're in Europe now? Like everyone. Uh, I think the change for me is going to be that, um, like next summer, we're going to start to go overseas and go away, mm -hmm. as opposed to our standard. You know, we have a house on Long Island and. <clears throat> we just got a place in Vermont, and uh, I'm like, I don't want their summers to be just like tennis camp and all that bullshit. So we're going to take them overseas next summer for like five or six weeks and rent a house. And we did that. We there. did that in Italy. You know, where, where did you, where, you, where'd you go? Where? San Cusciano de Bagne. It's about, it's in Tuscany. Uh, it's about 90 minutes outside of Rome, I guess. And, uh. You know, you said Bagne, you went to a bathhouse? With San Cusciano yeah. de Bagne. Yo, there was a, Bagno? an incredible spa there with just i'd never seen a spa like that with hot water coming down on you but i'll be honest with you it was a bit <laughs> rough on the kids at a certain point they were not excited all they wanted to do was catch air off statues and stuff like skateboarding tony hawk stuff i could catch so much air off that and when they saw the statue of david they they turned purple just this yeah. giant naked statue they yeah. just thought it was the funniest thing so there was a bit of that but i think getting them out there is cool i think that the girls might appreciate it more than the boys, I don't know. We're gonna go. We're gonna go overseas to Europe next summer, and uh, we're gonna plot that out because obviously it's a big crowd. And uh, where are you going? Because I want to tell the paparazzi. Can you just hit me with your I ten? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll text you. I'll text you. Sit, CC me. Thank I'll you. I'll CC. You. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but I want to. Before I forget this, which is, it's so funny to talk to you two guys and Dana. People would say to me, you know, your years ago, twenty sixteen. I mean, that's seven years ago. So I start doing the Trump thing, uh, and. Uh, of course, Lauren says it's going to be three shows. Don't be three shows. <laughs> oh, three. That's, that's yeah. Lauren. Yeah. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to well, you do a great one. So he's going to, yeah. we're, he says it's three shows if it's out because he's going to lose. So it's just going to be three shows. So I come in, I do the three shows. I'm laying in bed. Uh, we fall asleep. We don't have a TV in our bedroom, but I got my computer. And we fall asleep. And I wake up at three in the morning. I check it says Trump went one. He won. Oh, boy. Uh -huh. And I wake my wife up <laughs> and I go, Trump won. My wife literally groans and rolls over and goes back to sleep. And mm. I sit there and go, now I got to do this fucking thing for the next four <laughs> fucking years. But you, Dana, I'm not just saying this to be polite. I mean, you were a huge inspiration for me because I would watch, I'd show people wow. Bush. Mm -hmm. I'd show Bush and I'd say, now watch this. And you'd be like, Nagada. You know, you do all that <laughs> phonetics. Yeah. You do those insane phonetics with him. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, that's it. I go, you make your own character. Yes. It doesn't have to be some precise. No. I mean, I do, I do the worst Trump impersonation of anybody in America. But the idea mm. was, I thought to myself, what does he deserve? I mean, he doesn't deserve. I'm not Brendan Gleeson doing, <laughs> doing the Comey movie, doing the Comey movie with Jeff Daniels. It's like, but yeah, you know, I, I could do pencil necks, not even <laughs> literal pencil necks, but I could do Bush Sr. and I could do Perot. But for Trump, it'd be hard. But you did have this. You brought this hulking Trumpism to it, you know, that was just innate. Uh, I just thought, what did he deserve? He's a two-dimensional guy. And I said, and everybody doesn't understand that, you know, you know, 
infinitely better than I do, that you're firing the cannon on a live show. Oh, yeah. I'm in front of a live audience and TV cameras. Yes. And I just thought to myself, in acting school, they'd say, watch the performance with the sound off. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we'd watch the sound off and you'd see the person you were imitating or emulating in whatever way with the sound off. And with Trump, it was always like, stick your mouth out like you're going to suck the windshield out of the car. <laughs> Hold your hands up. <laughs> like you're, like you're yeah. waiting for someone to hand you a towel. You know what I mean, they're like, they're like this. You know? And uh, But a lot of what I said, I showed people your Bush. I said, look at this. I said, he's doing his own thing. He's come up with his own thing, you know. Well, because we didn't know. We didn't know what there was after Reagan, bumbling Reagan. We It was like a technocrat. It was like a flat voice. There was nothing there. And then kept teasing out little rhythms, going in that area, that thing. And then taking it to from not going to do it to not God do it. But the audience took it with me. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you the the terror until you get used to it of the whole studio is the only time it's quiet is right before the cold opening. Everybody's freezes. In the yeah. other sketches, yeah. there's movement and slats moving around. Well, 15 of course. seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Nine seconds. And then you have all these jokes to land. So I remember at one point to myself, I said, think of the script as suggestions. Because I would get, I, I, and when, it, when the script was too long, I'd say, I feel like I'm doing homework now, Al. It's too many jokes. I would rather do less yeah. and be playful. But how did you deal with all that pressure? Because it's all quiet. And here comes Alec doing Trump. You know, it's it's scary that doing the. Well, cold I mean, open. I'm standing there on the stage, and we're gonna do the we're gonna do the dress. Mm-hmm. And I'm not I'm not saying this to be amusing or whatever. I, I, we're standing there to do the dress, and I go, I have no fucking idea what I'm gonna do. <laughs> I don't I, I have no yeah. idea. All I know is I gotta stick my mouth out like this, mm. yeah. and put my hands up, and say, and, and I'm trying to do <laughs> just, just do the whole. And he's a guy who. Back then, in the early days, we had this gag where it was like, he was a guy who was always groping for a stronger word that he never found. So he'd say, <laughs> I spent, I went to this event with this crowd. It was a fantastic crowd. This crowd was truly, truly fantastic. You know, like he just loops back. He's not, he's not, a, no. he's not a lot of verbal muscularity. Uh-huh. He, he, has, he never runs into a ditch because he has these little phrases. Many people are saying, many people, you're going to see it. We're going to do it because we know how to do it. We know where we're going. And a lot of people don't want us to do it, but we're going to do it anyway. Now, when, 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 when Spade, when you did your TV show, how many seasons was Just Shoot Me? How many was that? Just Shoot Me was uh, 148 episodes. I think it was... Six full seasons, maybe Six seven. full seasons. That's yeah. great. I would love to do another TV series, I swear. Thank you for pulling yeah. it back to me. Because yeah. when Dana showed I, me his exactly bush, what... it was in his dressing room. <laughs> Good night. Um, no, I just wanted to say uh, about 30 Rock, because I want to, this is something I, I just didn't really know, the, the breadth of the awards for uh, Sweet Alec for the 30 Rock. Three Emmys, yeah. three Golden Go- Globes, and seven SAG Some Awards, too many. most in history. I think it's a little over the top, but I mean, that, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is, that's insane. Seven SAG when I, Awards. When I, when I went like the fourth or fifth time, I mean, like we're next to Tina, we're at the table, you're with your cast at the table, and they go, and the winner is Alec Baldwin. And I, I looked at Tina, I was like, now nah, come on. Then, you know, Jesus <laughs> but, where's the, where's the originality in this ballot? Well, it's also your but, peers. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I got one Emmy, but a SAG award, that's all actors giving you the award. Is that the, did you feel kind of, okay, guys, I mean, I appreciate you. <laughs> I was very grateful. You know, 30 Rock was something where the first season, I, I, I didn't want to do a TV series on because I wasn't sure. Uh, you know, it's like, as we all know, it's like, what's going to come up six years, if it runs mm-hmm. six, seven years from now. So, but I did it. Uh, I did the pilot, and I go, "Well, oh, you know, this isn't bad." I mean, and and I knew I wasn't funny. They're funny because they write. To me, I've never said I was funny or a comedian because I don't write. You're a comedian when you write your material. You're funny if you write, like Tina and Carla and mm. and, and uh, um, but I went in there and just uh, tried to play. People said it was Lorne. He wasn't really Lorne because this is a guy who. Um, it, it, it just is very unself-aware. I wanted to play a guy that was completely unself-aware. Like he yeah. walks into a room and doesn't realize how he's coming across. It, it didn't strike me as much, Lorne. You're right. I, <laughs> no. And also no. those TV shows, yours, uh, first of all, it's in town, which is a gift. Um, yeah. You don't have to go to LA. Second, you probably wouldn't have done it if it was not in, L- in uh, New York. But mine was a sitcom, which is Easier Hours. Yours is a... Is like shot like a movie. So some of those days can get really hard. 
Yeah, it was very tough on the crew, but you know, we we kept it pretty cool. It was because you know the joke was that Tina wanted to shoot everything she wrote. So if your character sitting down there and Jake Bukowski says, "What was your date like last night?" She go, "Well, whip, show the date." You don't describe it. We don't describe anything. Mm. We shoot everything. We should we show it. We don't tell. Oh, we show. You now watched. when you when you did your when you did your four, your uh, four camera, what studio were you at? Where were you? I was at CBS Radford in the Valley. You at Radford. Yeah. Same, same as Will and Grace. Yeah, with Will and yeah, Grace. Will and Grace came on a year after us, uh, or two years after us. Then they then they followed us on the schedule. But we were around when it was very tough. It was Seinfeld, it was ER, it was Friends, Frasier, Will and Grace. So it was tough. Veronica's Closet was the only one we were beating, I think, because we we were still in like the top fifteen. But Veronica's you can't closet. you can't keep love Veronica's You can't keep closet. up with Seinfeld. These shows are are monstrous, even years later. So we did a good job, I thought, and I really liked it, and it was a super super fun experience. But um, it's hard to get that again. I think I think we got canceled because we only had about forty million viewers or something. Well, the thing is, is I would tell people like when you have a fantasy. I'll never forget. I was I was parsing myself, and I was we were talking about a fantasy work situation. Yeah. And this guy and, and I start to go well, and I'm hedging. The guy goes, Alec, it's a fantasy. You have it. He said, have it exactly the way you. Oh want. yeah, make it up. And for me, my fantasy is I'm doing the Jack Nicholson show. I'm coming out there. Me and Audrey Meadows come out. We blow a kiss to the audience. How's everybody doing tonight? Everybody good? All right, I understand we have a birthday in the house. <laughs> and then we'll have a cake. And there's a 90-year-old lady in the front row. This is McGillicuddy. Everybody join me. Happy <laughs> birthday. We sing. She blows out the cake. Now, for the following week, we do the same fucking thing again. With Mrs. McGillicuddy is there. It's her birthday again. I just wanted to have like a, like, like a good time. I wanted to have a good time. And I don't want to do the four camera. So I went off to go do the thing with Kelsey. We're going to do this sitcom uh, with Kelsey. And I remember... Standing there, I'm, I'm literally standing on the edge of the set with Chris Lloyd and Volley, uh, uh, Chandra Shaken, and, uh, and uh, Kelsey was nearby. And I go, do you guys notice something about this set? And Chris Lloyd goes, what? I go, well, this guy has a lot of money. His wife has a lot of money. And his wife just left him. And I said, and there isn't a feminine touch in this whole room. And everything looks like it's from West Elm. It's all very inexpensive shit. West Elm. And Chris was, and, and Chris was like, yeah, that's interesting that you say that. But I thought, we're not going anywhere. They're never going to go this fucking time. The set, the set was like, anywhere. we're not going anywhere. We're going nowhere. We're, never, we're, we're, not even, we're not even leaving the gate, let alone getting on the runway. This never. looks a little so, too crate and barrel to get picked up. I've been in a lot of lot of bombs. <laughs> Have you? Oh yeah, I did a lot of pilots. I did a pilot with because I was thinking about that comedian thing. I it, folklore has it that Lucio Ball didn't really really write much, but you'd give her something and she would create magic. Obviously, but I did a pilot with Desi Arnaz Jr. called Whacked Out, and we're shooting <laughs> the pilot and we're bombing, and then all of a sudden I hear a voice on the other side of the studio going. What's wrong with you people? This is funny. And it was Lucille Ball in her later years. So Desi just kind of went, okay, mom's here. And then a huge line formed so that people could get her autograph. But the pilot wow. didn't work. But he was very proud of his dad, a super nice guy, Desi Arnaz. Now you, now, you both, you live in L.A.? You're both in L.A. right now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, I have a I'm, well, right now I'm at a, um, uh, a farm. A bunker? A bunker? Uh, a farm in... Sent this is north of Santa Barbara, <laughs> Acreage. You've you. you got a place uh, here's your quiz. Yeah, here's your quiz. What movie is that? That's Reds. I just watched it the other day. Jeez, oh, the God. other day. Damn, I love that. Yeah, I just watched Reds the other day. You did. I had, and and, I, and only did I watch Reds the other day. Here's I'm being very rude now. The moment I finished watching the movie, I hung up the phone and I called Warren and I talked to him about it for an hour. Well, that, so, why is that um, rude? That sounds amazing. No, I mean I'm not a, much of a star fucker name dropper, but it was like but he's Warren is who's, so mellow. I he's so kinda... he's so rich his mind. You know what I mean? Like he's a really, really brilliant. Fascinating well, why, guy how did you to. like you saw it when it came out? How how long had it been since you'd seen it, and how did it affect you? I've probably time? seen it one of the times since it oh. came out in 1980. I'd seen it before because I was always hooked on. I was really hooked on the on the witnesses on the testimonials. I love that technique where they had the real brilliant people talking, then they come mm -hmm. to cut to the dramatization. And um, you know, I'm watching movies now where it's like I don't mean to be so cliched about it, but it's like 
things you're just never going to see again. It's like movies now. I'm like, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, every movie I every movie I do now is like, you know, me and Marlon Brando trapped in an elevator for an hour. Like, no <laughs> sets, no costumes. <laughs> oh, because I don't. Catered. I don't know if this is no true. Props. I don't know if this is true, but I was told that Jack Nicholson wrote a very. He had sort of a thing for Diane Keaton, and he wrote a very, very personal, revealing a letter, and he puts it in the book that he gives to her in that scene to create all this sort of tension. But I thought he really stands out as Eugene O'Neill. I, I, the whole movie is, is brilliant. No, who would make a movie like that about the Soviet I was Union? Told, I was told he was in a wardrobe fitting. And he dropped his pants and said, my penis, my penis. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't hear that? The thing what, is is, that hat what is that hat you're wearing? Oh, it just says uh, Midnight Toker. It just got too okay. bright. I don't know why it got... Pick up right here. Midnight Toker, Alec, you know that song. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just a stupid fucking. And a Midnight Joker. But anyway, Reds, we have not talked about Reds on this podcast. So that's that's a bucket list for me. Let's talk about movies. What what give me five of your favorite performances, male or female? What are five movies where the acting uh, to you is so uh uh um Unexcelled. Butch, Butch and Sundance. I saw recently. I I, I kind of I have uh, I, Butch Cassidy and Sundance. Now I'm not kidding, Alec. No, 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 no. That's I, I'm not. Listen, Dana. I'm, David. I mean, I mean, I mean, Chris. I mean, David. You're being very sensitive. Chris. I was going to say Veronica's Closet. Veronica's <laughs> Closet is Veronica's Closet. There's a movie there. That's top show. Yes. Yeah. No, Joe. Go ahead, Danny. You first. Give me, yeah. give me three, three performances. Jesus. Men and three by women. Give me three by men. Jesus, three by men, three by women. Oh essential, my god! Essential, essential, essential. Oh. Uh, I was just saw a documentary on Catherine Hepburn. So on a Golden Pond, she she got me very. I I was very emotional about her performance in that. The I heard your Henry Fonda impersonation by the way the other day on the Con show. I listened. What show uh, was I, listened I doing? To quite a few shows on this show on the podcast. Show, yeah, did I didn't now. even. I don't remember doing it on this show. Gee, yeah, I remember yeah. a I fellow love, I like him. Alec. I do too. You want to uh, I'll, name, I'll name him. You want one great uh, film performance? Yeah. Yes. Two, two great before two great male performances embedded in one film. Twelve Angry Men. Uh, eh, incorrect. Okay. Incorrect. All right, but a good guess. All right. Because that, that's twelve good performances. The, the fail safe and Larry Hagman in fail Oh safe. God, what a brilliant movie! Yeah. Larry Lame. Hagman as the intern. Henry Fonda. Great, great acting. I, I want to know great. what he's. I don't want to hear what he's saying. I want to know what he's thinking. They're trying yeah, to prevent a nuclear war, and Larry Hagman is the, the interpreter. Do you know the movie, David? I do. I think they redid it. Yeah, but then it probably wasn't very good. George I, I, think somebody, I, I want to ask Alec a question. Well, go ahead. I don't mean to interrupt. Let's I like finish it. our list. Well, go ahead. Well, I just want to insert one thing here. My wife and I have a really uh, a love affair with a few movies with one actor. He's not considered a great actor, but the movies are touchstones for us. Three Days of the Condor. All the President's Men. Right. Yeah. And I think the way we were, those movies are movies you can watch a lot. I also loved, you know, Ordinary People that he directed. I just sort yeah. of have a Redford thing about Robert Redford as a producer, too. And Alex then, not giving it up at all. No, he. Well, no, but I mean, Redford, of course, is of a certain stripe where they where, where it was discouraged. It's like it's like Cruz doing Magnolia. Cruz does right. Magnolia. He blows everybody away. He's nominated for an Oscar, I believe. He doesn't win. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, everybody knows that Cruz in Magnolia is the greatest acting he's ever done in his life. Yes. Give it up. And then when he's yeah. done, and then when he's done with that, when he's done with revealing these darker edges of himself, his agents and producers and his, and his I mean, this is my uh, right. supposition. Yeah. They sit him down and they're like, "Okay, are you done now? Did you get that out of your system? <laughs> for sure. Are you happy now? For sure. <laughs> it's like Julia Roberts." <clears throat> it's like Julia Roberts in Mary Riley. Someone mm-hmm. sits her down with uh, um, uh, um, Malkovich. And they do the back. Uh, they do the uh, origin story of uh, uh, Jekyll and Hyde, and she does Mary Riley. And someone sits her down and says, "Now, whatever you do, this patented signature smile of yours, you're not going to smile or laugh one fucking frame of this movie. Don't you dare!" Right. We're going to go the complete devil. So they do the movie. And same thing. She's in a, a hotel <laughs> restaurant. They're going, are you done now? Okay. Now you got let's it get now? Back. Have you finished? Let's get back to Bring back your those thing. 200 teeth and we're going to go to. Well, back, John, back Wayne, to yeah, John Wayne played <laughs> Genghis Khan for one movie. That all, That's all you need to know about. Let's say, hey, Duke, uh, we're going to go get hey. back on the saddle here. Okay. 
All um, right, Alec, I got one. The, all right. Uh, uh, it's courtroom, the verdict. Okay, there's Paul Newman again. So there is. That's a good there's one, New, right? There's Newman, there's Newman with Lumetz, mm-hmm. who, uh, I mean, I just came today. I drove up to Vermont yesterday and came back from Treat Williams Memorial Service because of Treat died. Uh, I know. As you probably know. And, uh, uh, and uh, I was talking to the crowd there and I said, here's a guy who, you know, you go watch Hair. And here he is, the Dionysian love god, the rock god. He's dancing on the table. He's so fucking amazing. And within a couple of years, he does Prince of the City. And, uh, and, and, and I said, you got to understand movies in New York, especially in the Met, where the great, great film directors at the peak of their talent. I said, we're in Vermont. And I go, well, the line of actors who wanted to be considered to play the lead in Prince of the City or any great male role in a Lumet film. Well, that line goes all the way to fucking Albany. Everybody in New York wanted that part. Everybody. Mm-hmm. And, and Treat got that role. And, and, and with Newman, it, he knew, like, there's my chance to dig down. Now, the Oscars were in 83. I drove cross country for the first time to live in LA. I drive to LA. We're there. We have an Oscar party. And Ben Kingsley wins for Gandhi. David's going to go. He's in. He's no, no. Um, they, 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 uh, uh, ben Kingsley wins for Gandhi. And I've always said that those people who win for biographical films of, of living people, they bring the, the mantle of that person into the room, too. So I'm not as excited. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Are, are you giving an Oscar to Ben Kingsley's performance or are you giving an Oscar to Gandhi? Mm-hmm. So, so when Newman lost in the verdict, which I think is one of the greatest 25 performances of all time, we like threw our beer cans at the fucking TV room and like screaming and and and, and, and outrage. But that's a real right. The verdict, great fucking and and and, uh, 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 and James Mason. I use it. Oh. To, the, the, the money pays for my whiskey. My <laughs> whiskey. I loved him, James Mason. Yeah. Well, what do you think of De, De Niro and Raging Bull just as a performance? Um, that that's a pretty. That, well, De Niro is someone who is a... He's got a bunch of them, but yeah. Well, he's very gifted, but he also has the great... I mean, he'd be the first to say he has the great good fortune, especially during the, the genesis of his career, of being part of a battery with a great director. Raging mm-hmm. Bull wasn't Raging Bull because of Bob. Raging Bull was Raging Bull because of Bob and Marty. Oh, well, yeah. And Michael Chapman. Sure. I mean, the way they shot it, the way they cut yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, Marty is... Uh, I did a small part. In uh, um, The Departed, I did a small part in yep. oh, yeah. uh, The Aviator with Leo. And uh, 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 I mean, you know, you're just so, you're like high. You're so fucking thrilled to be in The, oh, the Departed. The Departed by itself could on you, its own is uh, what, what What's that? Uh, could you describe for a second what it's like to be on a set with him? Is it just because he's so focused, so likable? What is it about being around him and being directed well, you know, you, by him? Well, you know, you get from him. Uh, I, maybe I'm superimposing this, like he kind of telegraphs to you that we're going to do your scene here where you're outside the door. And I got a pipe and I'm talking to Leo through the door. Mm-hmm. Like, how would it's one? And he's naked and he's pissing in the jars and he's in the other room. And you know, with Marty, that you're smart enough, or at least you, you're smart enough to know it ain't about you. So let's get four or five good takes, get your pipe lit, get your lines down, get your angle to the camera. How are you going to play? You're kind of shit. The door is here. If you don't talk to a door because it's not the person. So you're kind of playing out and you're doing everything you need to do. And you want to get it over with quickly because you know that Marty wants to get in the room with Leo for the rest of the day. Mm. <laughs> Leo, 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 Leo naked, pissing in the bottle. Leo with the matted hair. Leo, you, you, you get it. But it's not about you. It's not about you. So yeah, awesome. you want to be efficient. And then they go off and they go like with the departed. We did the departed and, uh, you know, it was like, uh, Jack and uh, 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 Matt and those guys, they were the stars of the film. I just came in and I, I, mean, I played my little notes, you know what I mean? That's it. Just like a rat. Like a rat. I remember when Nicholson went for that rat face. It's ca- That's very bold in that moment in The Departed. But What's your favorite Nicholson movie? Um, Hard to say, but I got one. Go ahead. <sighs> Boy. Go. Let, let me hear yours. Maybe I'll... Maybe I'll... Um, if you're right there with well, now it, that I was gonna say, I'll uh, tell you if you're um, right. Uh, <laughs> of course you will. He's a mind <laughs> reader. Right. Of course you will. Um, Go ahead. What is the name? Now I'm blanking out because you guys. Were Five easy pieces. Scared. No, no, that's close. I like that movie. Um, uh, and, and not Chinatown, although I love Chinatown. Not Chinatown. Uh, love Chinatown. How much more? How much better can you eat? What can you have that you don't already have? 
the future, Mr. Gitz. <laughs> John, future. John Houston impression from Alec my, fa- my favorite story he told me, Jack, was that he's on the set and it's Polanski and Houston and, and Jack. And they're shooting these scenes between the three of them. And he said that there's Polanski holding forth and he's talking and talking and talking. And, talking. and finally, um, he's finished talking. And uh, he said that Houston pronounced his name Roman. He called him Roman. <laughs> and he said that Houston, he said that Houston looks at Polanski and says, he looks at Polanski and says, now, Roman, there are really only two directions, a little more and a little less. <laughs> and I thought, you want to know something? You're fucking right. You're fucking right. It is. Yeah. Right. Wait, let's let you guys say something while I look up this. Uh, okay, chapter. I got, I got an, I? an offshoot one while you're Googling. Um, you tell me if it's me or me. Go ahead. No, this is a different one. This is uh, Poba Greenwich Village with, I ain't going to be a fucking T-boy. A bed bug, Eddie? With Eric What's Roberts? Your favorite? Eric yeah. Roberts. That's a good performance. It's a little not the obvious, obvious one, right? My favorite, my favorite. Uh, Don't skim it. You're skimming me. You know what? I okay. want to find this. How about Deer, no, Deer, Deer Hunter for him in and fairness. Walken? Deer Hunter for De Niro and Walken. This is this. You do a great De Niro. My, favorite, Niro. my, favorite, my favorite Nicholson is Ironweed. Ironweed with uh, Meryl Streep. My favorite Nicholson. Yeah. He probably that movie would. makes me sob every time I cry. Yes. sob. I'm going to watch that tonight. I'm going to watch that tonight. Ironweed. I was going to see it, but I was sick that day. Uh, do De Niro? No, I'm not going to do De Niro because you're probably doing better. Than no, that. no, I, mean, I don't do a De Niro. No, I, does not. I don't uh, go in places where someone's oh, already. Oh, you know what, Alec? Alec, what, Alec what, you, when you did De Niro, did you're the one that was doing little bit, little bit? Well, we would do a, a, a little bit. A little bit. My favorite was we did the uh, Joe Pesci show. We did we did the mock. Uh, we did that on Pesci, but the other thing was the mock opening of Goodfellas. And again, oh. I and I took. I mean, I love going home to my neighborhood in Massapequa. I didn't do it anywhere. I go my own neighborhood in Massapequa. And it was Frankie the fish, and it was Louis the the, the Louis the, the limp. And then they get to the guy and he goes. And it was Tommy six times because he said everything <laughs> six times. So he, I'm going to go get the papers, get the papers, get the papers, get the papers, <laughs> yeah. get the papers, get the papers. Fuck. I was in that cold uh, opening. I was, I, was, I was out of focus, Jimmy. You were out of focus, out of focus Jimmy. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's hysterical. I remember I just saw this on like Instagram. Uh, they were pan. They pan around like every fucking person the cast is in it. And they go around. Everyone's got a different bit to do. Well, the um, uh, when I go back archivally and watch stuff, oh. I mean, I watch, uh, you know, I watched when I first came on there, and it's like, you know, uh, um, very little of it stuff I'm in, uh, except when we did the uh, we did the stupid thing. The only time I ever cracked when we did the show, and I think this was really the only time it was with Hartman, and we did this thing called the environmentally sensitive model. Which was a which was a take on uh, uh, the wild one, uh-huh. and I played this Marlon Brando. And one thing I do, one thing I do is if Veronica uh, Victoria Jackson's there, and they have her old dress where her boobs are like two garbage cans sticking in her face, you know? <laughs> and she has and she has a little uh, uh, a little sweater on. Her. And I walk up to her and she goes, "Can I come with you, Johnny?" I take her sweater and I go, <laughs> and I pull it down and I go, "Yeah, you can come with." You know what I mean, like I have to, I have to you know, get a good look. At it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I ripped the sweater. Up. But then in the end, uh, Hartman had played the lines like every masterful actor. He played the lines and threw them away until the take, until the end. And we do the, sh- the, the we do the air episode, and the guy says, "Boss, we gotta go." I, I'm I'm gonna ride off with his daughter into the sunset, and he and he owns the chemical company. And I go, and they, and, and this, his henchman comes and goes, "Boss, we gotta go. Tank number seven's blowing too." And all of a sudden, Hartman, who'd thrown the line away, turns around with this perfect whine in his voice and grabs my lapels and goes, take me with you. I just heard, so I I heard Phil for a second. That's really yeah. you. That- take, take me with you. He just did this, this horrible whine in the line. And I literally fucking cracked up so good in the air show. yeah he that, wasn't don't you love him oh oh we're, phil, we're going to we're going to do a tribute show to phil to, to talk about when, his when, greatness when? uh in september it's one or two dates at the groundlings oh. but you could zoom in and talk to us about him we we yeah. he everyone, wouldn't say anything nice bill Hader and will ferrell so many people have mentioned him as a touchstone and just the guy who could do anything oh. and we miss him, and so I just heard him for a second, and I got a little emotional. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, you, Sin- you captured it. The Sinatra Report. 
Oh, fuck. Oh, yeah. I got chunks of stool bigger than you guys or whatever. <laughs> it's just... Luther Campbell, he turned to Chris Rock. Can't understand the word. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> I'm just getting pops and bangs over here. Or <laughs> something like that. Yeah. So I, 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 I mean, that. What, when I go back and look at the show, that's what I look at. I look at this fucking I look like guys who could really, really, you know, Will and Sherry and uh, uh, Sherry. Kevin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you guys, some... Hans and Franz. My kids love Hans and Franz. They, they think that's fucking hysterical. That's very flattering at this point. No, they do. Yeah. Oh, my kids. I watch my show. My kids listen all over. Yeah, if you like that kind of stuff. Yeah, if you like that. Uh, what about you with the fake, with the bad soap opera guy? You've got canker. Um, remember, this, is when I, Vegas. this might be the first show you were on. Because yeah. I remember Bad Soap Opera, Green Hilly, where- Yeah, put the dog, my tongue in the dog's mouth. You're kissing yeah. everyone. Yeah, yeah. And uh, well, Canteen Boy was probably later. Uh, was that, that was early on or no? With you Can- and Sandler. Canteen? So it was Sandler, so it was a while ago. Sandler. Maybe yeah. 90, it, 91. It was probably early on because Sandler came yeah. on, yeah. not your first show. He came on probably by the time you were there, second or third show. Uh, Canteen Boy was a fucking hilarious one that we all love. You were cool for doing it. Even though it took some, uh, back then it was only letters. You could you could ignore them better. <laughs> it's not. Oh, they got, yeah, they letters. Twitter. Yeah, yeah, letter. We got a lot of letters about that. Um, what was that woman's name? Who was the the uh, standards person? She had like an English accent. It and wasn't come Audrey in the room. Pert. The, was she, she British? Yeah, yeah. Audrey Pert Audrey was British. Pert, Dick, Dickman. Yeah, I don't know if she was uh, exactly standards, but was it truly Pert Dickman? Was she? I yes. believe she was Dickman? Audrey Pert Dickman, and she mm-hmm. was quite a character, lovely lady. Well, I love she. I love when she would walk in. In my earliest days, I found the process so funny. She'd come into Lauren's office uh, or wherever they were for the for, uh, for the notes, and she's be like, "And now you can you can't say bowls, but you can say uh, uh, you can say." Pussy, and you can't say. Yeah, uh, yeah. You can say scrotum, but you can't say dick. And she'd have a whole list. Yeah, and here was this woman, like right out of Mary Poppins. Yeah. You can't say suck or blow, but you can say fillet. You can say gobble the goo, but you can't say spladoodle. You can say fisting. But you can't say anal digits. Sorry. You can um, say streaming ropes of jizz. Yes, but- you can say fisting. But you must cut the back half of the line up to the shoulder. You can't <laughs> say that. Good take. You can say squirting, but no, you can't say squirting, but you can say squirt. Yeah, so for sweaty hysterical. balls, did she give you notes for sweaty balls? I mean, sweaty ball. Went, that, that sounds you know, no I just, I, just, I just rode in their wake. I mean, I get in there with them and I thought, I don't want it. Literally, I'd sit there and keep the stone face and do it. And people say, oh, they love that sketch. I just thought, I just have to go with them. I have to, yeah. I have to, I have to get into their frequency. And they were so soft and so sincere and everything. Yeah. So I thought, just imitate them, get into the vibe of the show. And it worked. Cause there's sometimes you do sketches and you lose the rhythm between the live camera and the audience. Mm-hmm. One minute you're acting for the theater, mm-hmm. you know, and one minute, the next minute you're not. So I remember one time I played a guy who gets shot to pieces in a, in a, in a, in a foxhole. It's like a world war one movie. And I grabbed this guy and I'm like, I'm like, you know, Jimmy, I want you to do me a favor. Tell my wife and my kids that I love her. And he's like, I will. I will, Captain. I will. And he goes to walk away. I'm like, Jimmy. And I pull him back. And everything <laughs> I say is progressively more absurd. I'm like, yeah. Jimmy, I want you to tell my brother-in-law that a man that's paralyzed can never be more than half a man. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it keeps and, escalating. Yeah. <laughs> and it keeps going so bad. Like, like things that you could never. Do you, I mean, do you uh, focus on that, which is cancellation now and things you could never do back like then. Oh yeah, I did sure. an Asian character in 86. I had no idea it could never fly now. But on the third time we did it, Candace Bergen was the host and then we addressed it and she said, well, you are a bit of a racial stereotype to me in character Ooh. as this Asian character. Oh, oh. This was 86 and uh, even back then it did get a little bit of noise. But I, I lived well, in, you know, you know, in San Francisco. I lived near Chinatown so I'd known this guy I talked to him occasionally. He had a pet chicken. Dana, that's not an excuse. Okay, that's that's. Yeah. Stupid. I, live <laughs> I, up. I live near Chinatown. Yeah. <laughs> no, Alex, I did you do the this one? Is Forty years ago, folks. <laughs> Just hold your. Now, letters, did you ahead. do the one where you were a cop and you were sickened by a car wreck Jimmy, and, and you Jimmy. threw up? Yeah. And then, they ran the hoses across yeah, the yeah, stage, yeah, yeah, yeah. up yeah. our pants, like me and Fallon, and up my arm. And I said, "Kid, listen, <laughs> uh, you're going to have to get used to 
uh, bodies like this, or whatever the fuck it was, and, and, and Jimmy, and Jimmy, of course, was at the height of his cracking up in the middle of the structure. <laughs> yeah. And so he's like, like snickering and snickering. And finally, so he sees the body, and they had us hold our hands up in this very theatrical way because the little nub, the little nib of the pipe was coming in the palm. So Jimmy would go like this, and then this huge, like, garden hose projectile vomit spray would come out. And then him <laughs> vomiting makes me vomit. You know what I mean? So, yeah. but I want to say back to your Asian stereotype. Yeah. That, uh, that ironically, I apologize. Thank no, you. No, 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 no. It's okay. Um, but I'll never forget like one of the deftest, most unbelievable things I saw on the show was when we did the Japanese game show with Chris. Oh Farm. my god! Know all about and it. Fucking, yeah. oh and, 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 and and fucking Mike Myers comes out That's and unreal. plays the Japanese game show host, and was like, I remember sitting there going. Does Myers really speak At Japanese? God, it was How really good. Yeah. He, he, he nailed it. It was like I, didn't he was he like do Olivier. It phonetically, like actual Japanese language. He or? was like yeah. he was like Wasn't, he was like Olivia. He yeah. was so brilliant in that part. And Chris, I came here oh, fuck. to see <laughs> a game show, not be on a game show. <laughs> Quacky Serpy Niku. <laughs> and he gets it right at the end. And, and Myers going, Quacky Serpy Niku. Uh, yeah, yeah. Quacky and then they chop Niku. someone's finger off that gets it wrong. And he goes, I, 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 I again, I don't <laughs> speak Japanese. I don't think I'm going <laughs> to do anything here. With oh, the and guy, then they the guy loses. I, I, they put electrocute his balls. And then, and then I, and then, <laughs> then I lose. Me and Jeannie and Garofalo lose, and we chop our fingers off. They hand yeah. us the ceremonial nut. Yeah. And, 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 and you see, you see, we're, we're there, and, and Farley turns. He was like, he's like, oh, good lord. <laughs> we're slicing our fingers I, off. Dude, that's, that's, one, a that's good, such good, an all time sketch. Good voice. Uh, that is such a great uh, one. It's potent. Yeah, everything it is, about it is it. potent, man. I mean, it just lies. Some sketches are like that. Just like, can't, you can't take a look away. Now, do you guys, I mean, this is not, uh, uh, don't answer this question if you don't want to. Do you tune in every now and then and watch it? I mean, as alums, do you watch it every now and then? I watch mm -hmm. most shows, I'll, I'll be true confessional, <laughs> Sunday morning when yeah, I'm having online. coffee. Oh, and then they're, they're all stacked and I'm able to watch. I watch the show that way. So, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm asleep well, you got eight kids, so. uh, seven kids. What are you yeah, up at? Yeah, yeah. You're, not, you're not up that way. You late. can't afford a TV. Yeah, I'm asleep at 10:30. I can't afford an iPad. I don't. Have <laughs> no, I, Alec. I actually watch either Twitter, or Instagram. One of them I follow SNL, and what they do smartly is every sketch as it comes out, it pops on your Twitter like the full sketch. So the next day, you can yeah. sift through and you just can watch the whole one or a chunk of update or someone's bid on update. So it's it's very convenient and it still counts. I mean, you still get to see it. I wish we had that back then. If you missed the show, you had to wait for a rerun for six months. I believe, and, oh, sorry to interrupt, just in terms of no, the ratings, I think it's the highest rated show on on NBC. I mean, in, in prime or yeah. late night. Once they moved, once they did that, live, the uh, primetime thing on the West Coast, when they moved that to primetime, yeah. Yeah. and they do it live both places simultaneously, 8.30 in uh, LA and and. 11 30 in new york that changed everything i mean they're printing money and they get I mean, like no a one couple billion youtube views or 1.6 billion last year's yeah, and as, and as you know isn't it funny how over the years i mean I, i'm always going to uh, uh you know exalt lauren and um he's a dear friend of mine but it's like how many people have tried to take him down i mean how many people have tried oh to saturday night live dead to, or, to, yeah. to shoot saturday night and get rid of saturday night live and kill it off and have somebody you know another network and next season, season's 49. He's a year away from his 50th season. There's no other personality that I know of, but before we get to the book, the silly book, uh, it, you, when you're at this point looking back, you go, only Lauren could do all those frequencies. The Harvard people respect his intelligence. He knows how to talk to network people. So many, there must have been so many times like, let's do this pre tape turn it into an hour we should change the theme it's getting boring i mean he's held to this brand all these years and that's what makes it such a seminal show in the history and, and i, I but just, also his understanding was very his understanding of certain things was frequently maybe not every uh, mm -hmm. instance but his understanding of the situation was frequently so pithy like i like when i did 30 rock i knew one thing very early because I'd done movies with people and I, and, I, and, and I did movies back in the days when you had a 10 or 12 week schedule. Yeah. It's not like shooting a movie in five days like now. And, uh, <clears throat> and I was there on 30 Rock and I knew one thing. I said, she's my co-star. 
She's the creator of the show. She's the head writer. But I'm on camera. So if I have any issues about the writing, I can't talk to her. I need to go. That's why I assign Carlock that role in Vigi. And I'd be going to my room and I'd say, well, I don't think I want to say that. I don't think I will. Let's say this a little less harshly. Let's say this a little differently. And um, there might have been one instance where uh, uh, she said to me, well, I really want you to do this as written. And, um, uh, and, or something where it wasn't like a problem, but it was like, it was, it was like a one moment of, uh, of, uh, of debate about something. And I'll never forget. We're talking one day later on and Lauren goes, remember she's German. <laughs> Faye is German. Yeah. He goes, remember oh. she's German. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, and, and he'd always say things like that. Remember she's Lauren. German. Lauren, uh, Lauren uh, like a lot of smart people would take a giant subject and, and get it down to like four or five syllables. You know, like something like that. That's it. Does, he's not going to give you a ten minute speech about temperament or whatever. Remember, she's no. German, and that's he's all. You know, he, he is the master of that. Yeah. He send you flowers, send you present. It's always a one line joke. Yeah. What's your favorite Lornism or ones that most people know? Because I have one that I don't think everybody knows, but there's all oh, the, the the classics are right or exactly. Mm. You know, those are the simple ones. Mine is you'd be sitting there with dinner, having dinner at his house. And he'd be talking and you know, regaling you with stories of, mm -hmm. uh, of his real friends. Because his real friends are the ones from the original days, Steve Martin. You'd yeah. say Steve. Steve. And Paul. There's two Paul. 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 Yeah. And the other, yeah, the other Paul. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Left-handed left Paul. And Marty. Paul. Marty, uh, Marty. Marty and Steve came by. And I would say that Marty you're in that, that posse, too. Yeah. He, he speaks Ed Schlossberg you. came by. Yeah. Ed Schlossberg. Tino. But my favorite thing was he would... He would when he was his, his recall mechanism, his groping thing, which we all have, we have a thing we use to mm -hmm. to uh, read what I call a recall mechanism. So he's telling a story as he goes to recall, he go, well, it's, you know, it's it's like that thing where he'd say it's like that thing. Yeah. And I was going to call my podcast, which is called Here's the Thing. Yeah. We were going to call it. It's like that thing. <laughs> but then we thought we thought our other show. Now, but let me ask you this. <laughs> yeah. You guys started this how long ago? You've been doing this how many years now? No, year we're, we're year and a half. Was this a COVID born thing or no? Not really. It was just that the podcasting world had gotten so it, it had this bubble. It grew and it was going crazy. And then I had a little off label podcast. I was I had no network or any I was doing. David came on Damn radio. And so David and I are riffing and then our mutual manager, Mark Gavitz, he does a good impression. Hi, Mark. If he's listening, said, you guys should do a show, a podcast. So we just thought we'd try it. You know, because we liked hanging out. I moved back down to L.A. after raising my kids up in Northern California. And I kept seeing David, going out to dinner with David and stuff. So so then we thought we'd try it. And then because we attached the SNL theme, we don't really know why. But for our purposes, it kind of got really big. We're like, damn. Yeah. You know? I love the guest list. I'm blown away. And you used to, you two, I mean, I had an address, uh, a different address as rental, married to my ex-wife, blah, blah, blah. For 30 years, from 1983 to 2013. Then after mm -hmm. 2013, when my daughter Ireland turned 18, uh, I didn't have a place there anymore. And I haven't had a home there. And we would go out there and hotel it for a yeah. while when we had, we only had a couple of kids. And my point is, I haven't been out there in like forever. Ever. Mm -hmm. How is it out there now? What's it like? It's it's a it's a little rough around the edges, David, as you would say. I yeah. mean, there's a huge homeless problem and a, and a huge crime problem, and so it's you have to really watch yourself. They say, "Come for the taxes, stay for the crime." <laughs> <laughs> but and the weather. And also, it's finally sunny today. It hasn't been sunny, Alec, for six months. And if if all these other things are going on, at least give us some sun. It's a little different. I mean, I just like I'm from Arizona, so I like this side of the country. I wasn't ever like an East coast guy, but it's getting a little trickier. Did you struggle? Did you struggle in New York? You didn't like it? I liked it. It was interesting, but I didn't really feel any roots there, any home. So when we had weeks off, really? Farley would go to Wisconsin. Adam would go to New Hampshire. Chris Rock would go to Brooklyn. And I would just sometimes fly back home to LA and come back. But, um, you know, my brother was there for a while. And so I'd see them. Uh, one time I saw Alec Baldwin outside of, I think it was by Ollie's on the uh, west side. And uh, it was only after I met you once on the, on the Are one show. Are you saying that? Are you saying that? No, <laughs> no I, I, you were a superstar and, and, and some guy goes, hey, Squeeb Squabber, you said something funny uh, from my act. And then you pulled your parka down and you pulled your dick out. No, you pulled your parka down. <laughs> 
You and can't said, say uh, pull your hey, dick out. You have to say you reveal your yeah. penis. <laughs> Dana, this is a tear jerking story. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Anyway, so you started jerking off, and um, no, you uh, you pulled your your parking down. You go, hey, it's me, Alec from the show. I go, well, I know Alec. Why do you know me? So uh, it was very. I actually wrote on that for a while. It gave me a little uh, street cred. You know what's funny was it because I was there was when Stern and his wife uh, uh, had that benefit of the talk oh, were you house there? for the animal. I was there, and you fucking killed. You were oh, so funny. You, you did a stand-up thing for the benefit, and you were so fucking funny. I what didn't even know you were there. The, the oh, scary you, thing. You you were fantastic. How long did, was it? Uh, just, was it a tough crowd in your mind, David? Or do you remember killing You know, it, it was pretty nice because I started, it was it was very small. It was for Beth Stern's uh, Animal uh, Foundation. And so it was kind of, it was kind of, it was really fun to do. But, you know, I think Bon Jovi, John was there maybe. Uh, I don't know if you saw him. But a lot of our neighbors. It was, all, it was all a little squad out there. And it was nerve wracking because it was mostly these kind of guys. And Lauren. it was it was more fun. Oh yeah! By the way, Lauren, of course, throws you off because they go. There's going to be an empty seat next to Lauren for Jack, so Jack might come and sit directly in front of you in the front row, and so that makes me feel sick because you know we've all seen Ironweed. So I um anyway <laughs> I, I do I do my act. I joke <laughs> around with Beth. I make fun of her. I make fun of and then and then I sort of got in the act. Did about 30, 40. but oh, it was wow. super fun and got to go to Lauren's after. And, uh, what was the joke you made about drugs? It was something you said about scoring drugs, or something oh, you said. Maybe it which was. I literally, uh, I literally, I literally like sharded when you said that. I don't know. I'll say it, and then you'll be like, "No, it wasn't that." No, uh, it was like I said. Whenever I take drugs, my loser friends always. Whenever I take any pill out of my pocket, my buddy goes, "Give me one." I go, "You don't even know what it is." He goes, "Come on, dude, I'm married." I go, "What does that mean?" I go, "This one's for a sinus infection." It gives you cramps. He goes, come on, dude. I got kids. I'll take anything. <laughs> so I give it to him because he he wants it to be a bike. Then. And uh, and then I see him cramped over a half hour later. And then he gives me the thumbs up. It's different. I'll take it. Um. So anyway, Alec, it's not that joke, but there's a whole thing. I'll it wasn't send you, that joke, actually. Yeah. I'll send you a link it was, to my it was, it was, specials. It was a better show. It was a better you joke. You fucking asshole. I knew you were going to say that no matter what I said. I fell into that. David uh, has yeah. called our guest a fucking asshole. Rolled you. I log rolled you. Now, uh, um, the, the, um, uh, so LA where yeah. I lived every, I mean, I lived in Venice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember, uh, I, you know, you don't know Venice, man. I remember Venice. Oh, yeah, with the Venice guys is, skates. you don't know Venice. Venice you is don't know beach, Venice. beach and, and, and Venice funky, when they were selling LSD. I was on roller skates. Yeah. He'd be roller skating down going, Sid, Sid, I got you, Sid, I got you, Sid. <laughs> yeah. And we would, we would hang out there. And I remember it was like bright lights, big city, literally. It was Jay McInerney's my neighbor. And, it was like bright lights, big city, because I would be so fucking wasted. Because remember, I always say, tell people because I'm 38 years so Yeah, you I were fun for a while much. there, right? So you partied pretty I have, hard. I have, I have, I have, I have my moment. But the point is, is that in New York, as I as we always discuss with people, is in New York somebody else is doing the driving. You're on. You're back in the 80s. You're on your feet. You walk everywhere at 10 bars every street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 you know, taxis, no Uber, then subway, a lot of subway, and we would be fucking shit faced every every <laughs> night. I go to LA. And I start making money and uh, I'm shit faced every night behind the wheel of a car. And I get to like the second year of me doing, I think I had a five liter Mustang. I'm at Warner brothers and I want to go home because I'm tired. It's two o'clock in the morning and I'm at Warner brothers and I live in Venice. And by the time I get to the 10 freeway going West toward the beach, I get near uh, like, uh, you know, uh, one of those streets there. Um, Sentinella or whatever yeah, the fuck it is. Hell. And I, and I, and I saw tell. And I'm going to flatten out. I go, everybody tells me this car will do blah, blah, blah. And I flatten this car out and I'm doing 135 miles an hour on the Santa Monica freeway at God. two o'clock in the morning. Jeez. I remember I literally thought for a moment, I stopped and I thought, if I had a car accident now, I would just turn into a pizza. I'd just become a pizza. Yeah, powder. And I said, I got to stop. So I stopped. I slowed the car down, got sober, gave the car to a friend. I gave it away. I said, you can have it. And a, um, a, a, a friend's kid. And, um, and and the point is, is that, you know, I lived out there and I lived everywhere. I lived in the valley, Beachwood Canyon, everywhere. And uh, it's just so weird to me. It's such a huge part of my life. And I never go there. Never, never, never. Do you not get offered work? Because here in New York, 
Yeah. Because well, here in New York, we, we it, it, it's easier here because in New York, we've been stepping over bodies for decades here. Yeah. You know I mean, it's no big deal to us. I mean, like it is, you guys are all a little. We got a bit precious. of Venice is really bad for that. I mean, yeah. I'm not making fun of homeless people. They're great. You know, they're not great, but they're. Okay. I'd, be up, I'd be up all night and the sun's coming up and then you hear, uh, you hear the sand gravers out of the beach, oh. cleaning the beach. Then you'd hear the power washers where they would wash all the filth off the benches on the ocean front walk in a truck with a tank on it. Mm-hmm. And by the time you woke up uh, a Monday afternoon, because you've been sleeping all morning because you were so fucked up, you'd go out on the beach and everything was <laughs> gleaming. It was the, like the little window. Monday afternoon and Tuesday during the day that Venice was like fresh and new. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I loved living in Venice. Love. 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 People still I never, love I never go. Yeah. Yeah. People still, I mean, there's no so other getting, parts are nice. Without getting specific, where are you? Are you west or are you east? I'll just give you the Centra- latitude Centra- and Centralized. <laughs> I'm yeah. uh, very, I'm pretty much central. in Hollywood, uh, in, in the hill a bit. Just I used mm-hmm. it's not even Beverly Hills anymore, as my dad said. Kind of sliding down the old fame ladder, huh? If you were, but <laughs> my dad is supportive. Uh, Jason Schwartzman had the best line. I did a commercial with him. It's absolutely a horrible commercial, and I fell in love <laughs> with him. He's such a sweetie. That we did a we did a we did a commercial for Amazon Alexa. And it was the biggest fucking waste of my time, but I loved him. And I turned to him and I go, and I, and I, and I forgot. I mean, I knew who his mom was, but I just, it went out of my head for a minute. And I go, where did you grow up? And you saw this pause, like he was kind of ashamed and he was kind of awkward. And I go, where did you grow up? And there's a pause and he goes, uh, Westwood North of Sunset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to clarify. Oh, I'm in uh, Sunset Brilliant. Plaza, which is fully fucked. I know I mean, Sunset Plaza. Yeah, I, it's yeah, nice. I mean, parts of it. And I, I live near, near. I have a tenth of an acre. I'm not doing too bad. <laughs> it's actually well. It's it's quite. <laughs> I a, like land. It's a nice house. <clears throat> yeah, but no, it it's way. good. Alec, what about that? What did he? I don't know if he knows about that book. Burn it down. Did you hear that? Do you know what book that is? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, the, yeah, the one where the, the the woman is attacking everybody. Listen, I mean, I've been attacked. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had people attack me. Oh yeah, and it's always the same. Tired, and I mean, and let's face it: as you as you get older, you realize some of it I brought on myself, mm-hmm. some of it not. And you must always tell yourself it's hard, but you must always tell yourself that tired trope, which is consider the source. Mm-hmm. So, like, if, like if I said, if if Letterman made fun of me, if Ellen DeGeneres, somebody I admire, Chris Rock made fun of me, then I'd really be upset. I'd be sad. Mm-hmm. But some of the people that over the years, especially recently, that have attacked me are people who. I don't think they're funny. They don't have any talent. They're just a bile duct of hatred for people online and so forth. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, I don't, I really doesn't bother. Yeah. They're not anybody who I give them too much because I've been around people. When I gave that image to you, David, of the log rolling thing, you know, I did early then I did early Letterman in the, in the, when he was doing the old show mm-hmm. uh, on NBC late at night and he could just gut you. He was so clever sure, yeah. and so quick. Yeah. And uh, you, and you were very, very, uh, you know, what everything you said was what I call red wire, green wire. Because it's like in the old episodes of Mission Impossible, where it's like the guys here is like, which wire do I cut? The red wire or the green wire to defuse the bomb? When you're caught with a decision, a quick decision that could be fatal, we always say red wire, green wire, uh, my friends and I. And, and it's mm-hmm. like, with Letterman, it was like, you know, don't, he's going to kill you. He's in a log road. And uh, uh, there's a handful of people I've met uh, who are just that witty and that quick, like Spade. I mean, Spade is so quick, you know, and uh, 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 it's, and, and Tina, you know, and uh, it's just, uh, uh, but when, so those people did me in, it's a little bit more disconcerting, but there's a lot of them where you sit there and go, is that all you got? You know what I mean? It's like, well, it's, some, it's, it's a, some it's a come weird from time. a fun place and some feel really going after. It. And, and that's the difference. Like I've made fun of people on Hollywood Minute and stuff. I, and I like, 99% of them, uh, I don't do it as much anymore. But when I make fun of people, it's usually with more of a spin and fun, but sometimes it feels too rough, you know, and you go, that one is sort of directly at someone. And that's tougher to take. Because people, but you like, and I, but, but, but we, all, we all, go ahead, people. Well. No, I'm just saying, I, when people make fun of me, I don't like it as much as when I make fun of them. <laughs> it's basically. Well, it's funny how we all know, we're all, we're all old enough to know especially me. I'm a bit older than you guys. And no, no, I'm older than you, Al, but we'll get to that later. I'm 65. How old are you? Eight. Jesus. 68. You're like a kid to no. me. No. Are you fucking kidding me? You're like a kid to me. You're like a baby in a crib. Me. You're like a high I school. Kind of, you're like a, 
But you sound like a child. I mean, you sound like a child all the time. Ah, you should see his oh, wiener. Hi. Well, I'm, you, see, you sound like an Asian. You sound like an Asian child. <laughs> Every impression is Asian. <laughs> yeah, do the Asian child. Uh, but you know, but you guys know. Looking back, because we all started devouring content, whatever it was. I started devouring the old Warner Brothers gangster movies when I was ten years old. Yeah, I watched Dean Martin roast. I wasn't going to watch. I mean, I watched TV up to a certain point. I watched series TV until a certain era. I watched. The Munsters and Gilligan's Island yep. and the Beverly Hillbillies sure. and all this other shit. And I watched, uh, you know, Mr. Ed and the Ed Sullivan Show and Candid Camera when I was a little boy. Then when we get to what I call the Aaron Spelling epoch, I turned off TV. I didn't watch. Love, I watched Love one Boat. show, <laughs> Love Boat. Oh, that's the hotel, which I was on actually. Hotel, but the, but the, but the hotel with uh, James Brolin. But the gag is that, um, you know, I watched one show when I was like in high school. And I was a I was a teenager. I'd smoke a big fatty out the window of my bedroom, and I'd watch uh, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. I was addicted to that show. Wow. I started getting more into movies. But my point is, is that we all know from watching Dean Martin roast and things that when Rickles would attack people, everybody was in on the gag, and he always ended it with a little dollop of love, a little P.S. I love you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When Joan Rivers would do her thing, which she could just eviscerate, mm -hmm. she did a lot of it to their faces. Like there's a clip online of her just pissing in the face of all the hosts of The View and saying things about them. That's the funniest thing you've ever seen in your life. But mm -hmm. same with her. She knew they were in on the gag, mm -hmm. and sometimes not. But she was uh, um, she was good at it. But there's other people now uh, who I've seen recently, uh, a couple uh, lately, where it just, uh, there is no bottom. I mean, there is, normally there was a bottom. And now there is no bottom. They will say anything. They will say anything. That's kind of tough. Well, we're in the era of... This is maybe the biggest cliche, but if it's outrageous, it's contagious. So people, you know, how do you be outrageous? How do you get attention? How do you trend? How do you make noise? You know, and it kind of dovetails into these things. Criticism. This is why I'm quitting. I'm retiring. I'm, I'm retiring. I'm done. Have we got to, if we finally, are we going to trend? Finally. We don't, we never trend. We I'm never retiring. Yeah. Thank you so I've got a, I've got a, I've got a couple of projects that I'm attached to. Yeah. And I'm going to do these projects. And then I really, I realize I've gone. From COVID, and then, of course, a very difficult period of what happened in New Mexico, where I was kind of cloistered, I mm -hmm. have, I have uh, been home with my kids and left. I either shot in New York, I, we filmed in New York, or I went away almost never. I go like a week, I come back, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe twice a year. I've been home with my kids, and I, I drive my kids to school every day. Mm -hmm. My four oldest ones go to school together out in Brooklyn. They go to a full language immersion program in Brooklyn in Spanish. Oh. and. I'm with my kids and it's like, I've rode my kayak into this current and I can't get out. Like, I don't want to miss being with my family, being with my wife, being with my kids. When I mean, you got to offer me the check uh, uh, or, or you got to give me the uh, towering creative opportunity where I'm like, I, I don't fucking care anymore. Right? Like I've done that. Acting is something which I don't have the same feeling about. My kids all have a very, very, uh, my kids are New Yorkers, you know, so there's a really kind of a, there's a Pesci-esque, De Niro-esque, Pacino-esque They're edge. tough kids then. Yeah, no, they're, they're tough. And so like you, my, one, yeah. and my son, uh, Romeo, who's the most beatific, I mean, if I, I used to look at pictures of my son Romeo online, he's absolutely the most beautiful boy you've ever seen. And we're in the, uh, last summer, we're in the playroom, and I say, listen, pal, like, we're going to go have dinner. I go, leave the toys here. So leave the puzzles and the toys here. We're going to go have dinner. And then, because when you bring the toys with you, you don't eat. So let's leave the toys here. And then after dinner, we'll come back and we'll play with the mm -hmm. toys. And he stares at me. It's like an Eastwood movie. He stares at me. He goes, you're a bitch. <laughs> and I Jesus literally God. start to hyperventilate. <laughs> I start to, I start to like, grab my chest. And I go, what did you say? And he doubles down. He goes, I'll call you a bitch. Like, you know, I'll see you a bitch. Jesus. And I raise you one bitch. I call my wife in the room, and you realize they get all this on YouTube. So we we have their pads filtered, but if they get a hold of my pad mm -hmm. and yeah. they go on my safari and they go and watch, you know, uh, uh, they're you know they're watching uh, good films. Movie called some You a Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> they're watching that new series on Netflix. You a bitch. 
<laughs> I call you a bitch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he sees that somewhere and now he's using it with you, which is very ballsy. Sorry, but what age and what size is this yeah, human age? being when he calls Can you, you the bitch? Can you take him? Age he's and a little, size. He's a little... He's the size of a Tootsie Roll. He's a kid. <laughs> he's a fucking kid. Yeah. I have things for dinner bigger than him. You know I mean? It's like he's no, but my son, my yeah. sons are my son Raphael just turned eight. He's getting okay. taller and lankier. My son uh, Leo is seven. Mm-hmm. My son Romeo is five, and my son Eduardo is two and a half. He'll be three in mm-hmm. September. But my point is, is that it's like watching human development mm-hmm. in real time, being around them, watching them change, watching them try to tell a joke. Yeah. For the first time, trying to be funny for the first time. Oh, yeah. It's all. Um, uh, uh, to watch when they have some real generosity between them, you know, when they're really together as a unit and they love each other, when they're not, you know, when it's not uh, 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 Hagler Hearns here uh, on Friday yeah. night, you know, the um, it's just something that's very hard for me to uh, to give up. So, I mean, I want to I want to work, but I'm, I'm, I hate to leave. Those I are cry. nice moments. Yeah. It's getting to know yeah. a human being from the inside out. Now, Spade, you have you said you have a daughter. Mm hmm. How old is she? 14. Oh, she's 14. Yeah. yeah. And you yeah. raised her in LA. No, she's in she's in the Midwest. She doesn't live with me. God. We'll mm-hmm. do a side chat. Um, she doesn't live with me, but we- uh, You can DM but she's later. she's great, and I'm seeing her next week. So I see her a lot. It's just, it's not the perfect, typical situation. I, I, I've been there. I've been you know what I mean? So My daughter, Ireland, just had a baby. So I, 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 I occupy oh, that rare did? space- my daughter Ireland had a little girl named Holland, and uh, 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 that's a tradition of my family naming her children after countries and regions of the world. You know, uh, Alec, uh, yeah. I talked to Ireland once. I think she was about eight. Um, this isn't. She a called you a bitch. She this said isn't... you're a bitch. <laughs> she called me, and then she I'll hung call up. You but, a bitch. but I had caller ID. Uh, no, she. Uh, no, Kim. I worked out where Kim did, and she had just seen the Emperor's New Groove, an old cartoon movie I did. Mm-hmm. And she said, would you call Ireland as the llama? I was played a llama. It's online. I'll send you a link. So I, I call, because Ireland's just a little kid that likes that movie. So she talked to me uh, like, uh, I don't even know what I'm saying. But anyway, you get it. I, it's called I'm a Great Guy, whatever. That's the moral don't you story. love? Don't you love doing animation? Oh, yeah, and I'll say fun. I'll say this without an ounce of irony or sarcasm. People say to me, "What do you think is the greatest movie you ever were in? What's the best movie you ever made?" And I, without hands, and I go, "Boss Baby, Boss Baby." <laughs> oh yeah, greatest movie I ever made. I had more fun. Those guys, because as you know, the 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 the, uh, uh, the concept, the one line on it is that animation is so thrilling because can your imagination keep up with technology? Can they? Because you can do anything. anything. What have you got? So great, you know. And I would do Tom McGrath, who directed and do those things, and does a lot of voices in Madagascar. Did the Penguin in Madagascar? So, I mean, Tom McGrath, he made me fucking cry. And I would do. I had more fun doing the first Boss Baby and the second one too. But the first one was like the first one, so it was so great. And I love doing animation. Love, 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 love. love. I think Boss Baby was funnier than it was supposed to be because I heard so much about it. It was like, you never know what those things, you know, you do it. and uh, But the art, I, mean, like, really I remember sitting in this room, I'm in my kid's playroom. I'm in yeah. my kid's playroom right now because the only room is quiet because they're not here. And um, I remember doing Boss Baby and like a year later, because I never watch my own films. I can't stand and watch my own films. And uh, I almost never do. And so, but I'm sitting with my kids and they want to watch Boss Baby and I watch it. And I can start getting tears in my eyes. And I called Tom. I go, Tom, this movie is so beautifully done. Like the artwork. I mean, they the do, vision. Yeah. And the artwork is so, I mean, those guys, they blew my mind. You, you still do a lot of that, Dana? Any uh, animation? I did a couple of Secret Life of Pets. Uh, first one was was huge. The second one didn't do so good. But I have a ride at Universal. I, pl- I They basically asked me to do the grumpy Ooh. old man as a hey. dog. I don't like the way things are. So I was a basset hound and I had wheels <laughs> for hind legs. He was sort of crippled. But I just randomly, this is a complete non sequitur. Two of my favorite performances of movie stars, and they're very operatic. They're theatrical. What One is Robert Shaw as Quint in Jaws. The book, yes. the bookend is Al Pacino as Scarface. Yes. Those are yes. both operatic, rhythmic things that just really have always stuck with me. And both movies, by the way, too, are just. Now, you're, now your boy is, um, you have two boys. Two boys, yes. And how old are they now? Uh, 29 and 31. And are any of them in the biz? 
One is uh, it has a production company and he's doing stuff. I've done stuff with both of them, a scripted podcast called The Weird Place. So they've been trundling along. They've done some stand up. I think my youngest is really, um, it sounds, it's, it's, he wants to be a farmer, <laughs> which I love. I mean, really That's cross, cool. cross pollinating and, and growing. Where is he? Where is he? He's up here in, in the, at the farm. Yeah. He's at Farm Aid. He's at, at the, the farm. farm. Where, uh, can, where, yeah, you're, like, you're into location. We are exactly. Uh, <laughs> no, he, Alec knows LA and he misses it. He could, has to come out. Could I just on this? No, I, miss, I miss, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want on this subject because I, I love movies so much, but I just want to say a movie of yours that there's two here that are on our dial for my wife and I. The, the Edge, anytime relatives come, oh, oh we're going to watch, edge. we're going to watch a movie. And if they haven't seen The Edge, because I'll but, you and Anthony, my favorite movie, my Alec. favorite movie, to, my yeah. favorite movie to shoot, because when I, I was in, I was on vacation with my ex-wife. I'd flown to LA and done a read through with Mamet. Mm -hmm. Mamet wrote the script. It was called Bookworm originally. It was much more, um, yeah. it was much more uh, uh, baroque before they changed it. Mm -hmm. And David wrote the screenplay, and we go do a reading, and De Niro was going to play the lead. Oh. And the character is named Charles Morris, and he's the scion of a very wealthy uh, uh, English family, or whatever, very rich guy. And I think that De Niro realized that he was more Stavros Niarchos than he was Charles Morris. So he mm -hmm. was not a, 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 off the Mayflower type. So he bowed out. And I'm on vacation with my ex-wife, and the phone rings, and they said they got Tony Hopkins to play the lead. And I burst out sobbing. I thought, my greatest dream uh -huh. to work with Tony. So we go off to the Canadian Rockies, and we shoot it up in Banff. And I have so many memories. Harold Perrin, who was in Lost, he played. He, there were two great lines, uh, none of them by me, by the way. So Harold Perrin gets to the rehearsal, and he sits at the table. We're going to rehearse in this uh, this uh, hotel ballroom thing they had, conference room. And Harold Perrin sits there and goes, Anthony Hopkins, Alec Baldwin, and me. I wonder which one the bear is going to eat first. <laughs> 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 and he was fun. And then Tony and I, because he's from the same town as Burton, and of course, he's a great Welsh. Richard Burton with that, yeah, Welsh. Richard Burton, yeah. He's great with the Welsh. He has a great Welshman mm -hmm. raised and, and trained by the, at the foot of uh, Olivier at the National. Mm -hmm. He could do his Burton. So we would do dueling Burtons. We would do dueling impersonations of Richard Burton. Oh. And Tony, and Tony won. He, he, the crew applauded him at the lunch table because he did his, we would go back and forth sometimes. And finally, he got it down to a haiku, and he and 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 he looked at me. He did. He looked at me. And he goes. He goes. I can't do it. Elizabeth was my voice. It, right? No, he did. He, he literally. He goes. He goes. Elizabeth baubles <laughs> yeah. and stones. He goes. Elizabeth baubles and stones. White wine. Marbella. <laughs> well, that's where it's my. And then he plants his face in his foot. He passes out into his lunch tray. And uh, and everybody went. That's it. It's over. He's the winner. He's the victim. I had the same thing and, with uh, him. I did a movie that was not well received. Road to Wellville. What'd you do? Road to Wellville with Anthony Hopkins, and we did. I a love lot. Road to Wellville. It was uh, it was unique. It was I love Road to Wellville. Interesting. I, I love that. I was the ne'er to well son, but I got to hang out with him and do stuff with him, and loved him. Love him uh, now. Uh, Parker. Parker. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Alan Parker. Alan. Par I love yeah. Road to Wellville. Yeah. I love it. it you was, know what? I always used to embarrass myself. Whenever you love a movie that the star considers a misfire, um, yeah, I, and I always say that whenever I see Hanks, I say, I love Joe versus the volcano. <laughs> and was it yeah, too. fine? And and, and, he, and, he, and he's like, oh, okay. Like, he doesn't really mm. know how to, what to do with that. But <laughs> what was the other movie you were going to mention? The Edge and what? Well, The Edge and then another one that just uh, uh, is, it's complicated. We, I just thought, you, I were, I thought you were just so funny in that. I mean, you really went, I mean, I... You're, it was hysterical. Well, I always thought when, when Nancy Myers asked me to do that, mm -hmm. she said to me, um, she said, do you care that Meryl is nine years older than you when you prepare to play her love interest in a film? And she goes, because the men do it all the time. The men uh, have leading ladies that are far younger than them, and they seem to get away with it. Mm -hmm. And she's going on and on and on about it. And I go, I said, Nancy, I said, my character doesn't want to bang his ex-wife. I said, my character is still in love with his ex-wife. So that's a huge difference. And I said, and so to fall in love with Meryl is probably the easiest thing I'm ever going to do. I mean, like, I'm going to steal your money. Uh -huh. And I get on the set, and Meryl really was like, like 
among the most oh, amazing she's... people I've ever met in my life. Amazing. She's sexy. Now, both of you named someone before we run out of time no, here. What, what? Before we run out of time here. Uh, yeah, we we're out of time. We go someone... as long as we want. Right. No, go What's no, no. your question? But, but name, uh, name somebody you both worked with that really was just a, a joy. In any venue, movies, TV. Oh, that was a joy? Did you, you, you did what you did? Did you love George Siegel? I did love George. I Taylor. love yeah, him. Yeah, I yeah. love him. You can't help but he had everyone yeah. on his finger. Yes. Oh, he's so oh, good. Yeah, what such a, a luck out. And he used to make so much fun of me because when if I would miss a line or something, he'd look at the audience and go, "You know, I used to do movies with Elizabeth Taylor. Now I work with this <laughs> fuck up." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so exactly. funny. That's Dana, like that's like him. Mickey Rooney. Uh, Mickey was a, was eccentric. He was tough. I would say just. At where I was in my life being cast as the third lead with Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas's last movie, not a great movie, but to hang out with them. And Which the, movie? It's called Tough, tough guys? guys. I know. Tough. You Did you ever hear my story about that movie? No. Of course I, you, you have no? stories about tough guys? Uh, uh, Spade, what do you mean? A dog biscuit or a Girl Scout cookie? What is You're it? telling a story. Don't worry he's, about me. He, uh, he's, okay, got a, he's up a glycemic, so he's got I, he's got to eat everything. I'm blacking out, Alec. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like, no, wait. Like Sherry said in the podcast, yeah, exactly. it was your turn to pay. Your turn to pay at Fiorello's, and the waitress <laughs> so, says, and, and, wait, and the waitress says, your friend is passed out in the bathroom. <laughs> yes, Sherry was he's one of our glycemic. favorites. Yeah, Sherry yeah, was. So, so yeah. Um, go ahead. The famous story. That, uh, Kirk uh, and Bert. Uh, uh, the guy brings the stack. The PA brings the stack of glossies, mm -hmm. knocks on the door, uh, uh, hands the stack glossies to Bert Lancaster, hands him a pen. Bert, Bert Lancaster signs a glossy. He goes, that doesn't look very good. Did you have another pen? You have a Sharpie. And the guy pulls out, yes, he has a Sharpie. So he signs Bert Lancaster. <laughs> and he signs all the glossies. And so the guy takes the pen, the regular pen, trots over to uh, uh, um uh, uh, Kirk Douglas' trailer, hands him the glossies. He signs to Kirk Douglas and he sees how scrawny it is next to Bert's name. And he goes, he goes, do you have the other pen? Can you go get the other pen for me? And he goes running back to Bert Lancaster's oh, yeah. trailer, knocks on the door and Bert Lancaster comes out. Bert Lancaster comes to the door with a Sharpie and says, I suppose you're looking for this. <laughs> he knew. Yeah, they had a competition. He knew. They knew each other. They knew each other. I saw him when they did the concert version because here for years they've had great success at City Center with uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Encores, the Encores program, where Chicago mm -hmm. was birthed from there. Mm -hmm. And they do all the shows, concert style, that are not going to get a full production in New York again. A Boys from Syracuse, Fiorello, all that stuff. So the seasons, for years and years and years now, I used to be on the board of City Center with Joanne Woodward. She corralled me to do that, her and Paul. And um, uh, the seasons, so they decided to try to do that in L.A. And they, it was called Reprise. And they did this beautiful, wonderful uh, uh, a musical rendition of uh, All About Eve. Mm -hmm. And Stockard Channing played uh, the uh, Margaret, uh, uh, Stockard Channing played the Margot Channing role, the Betty, the Betty Davis role. Mm -hmm. Callista Flockhart played uh, Eve. Um, uh, 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 what's his name? Why am I blanking out? Um, Allie McEve. Uh, all right, Allie McEve. Uh, well, no, what's his name? Um, Tim, Tim. Uh, um, Rocky Hart, Tim, Tim Robertson, Curry, Tim Curry, Tim Curry, wow. Tim, Tim Curry. Curry played the uh, uh, George Sanders role. I mean, the cast was fucking unbelievable. But the opening of it was this big, gigantic, tufted, uh, I want to say chaise or a bed. And the curtains part, and the thing is moving toward the audience. And it's Kirk Douglas is the narrator. Wow. Sitting on this bed. And what a way to open a fucking show. And he had already had a stroke. He had oh, a stroke, mm -hmm. so his voice was not that bad, but you, he was impaired. But you didn't care. You're just sitting there going, "Oh my God!" The opening of the show is fucking Kirk Douglas, yeah, cool. who I worship, worshipped. I worshipped as a, he was one of the few movie stars who was also a great actor. But one of the few. Well, those guys had their own production companies. They do their sort of art film, and then they do the the, the studio film. I mean, they were really for, and just sitting listening to them and the way they teased each other it was very uh it was just it was I, I, that was me out of body like i'm in a movie with kirk douglas and berlin it doesn't oh, even make I sense am. this was a year well, before i got my, snl you know my other favorite kirk douglas story is he apparently he's on the set of like uh, whatever the movie was him and wayne uh with john ford uh the war real, wagon Bravo. something i'll look it up the but, war uh, wagon, they're on the I set think. of a movie yeah. and and kirk douglas walks up to john wayne 
And he said the Warwick. I think I think Dana's it's the Warwick. So proud. It it wasn't it the it. Warwick and they started, or was that William Holden? Mm, sorry, I know it was Kirk Douglas. I thought. You're gonna look it up. Look it up. Look it up. The Warwick. You're making me. Uh, uh, you're John making me, Wayne. Making me. Alex still trying to figure out how to spell Nicholson. Yes. He's Googling again, everyone. Hey, he's going to log but roll you. Mr. He's going to log while, roll you while if you're not Alec careful. does this, I'll say, Dana, he's the only one of two people with a standing invitation every year to host SNL. Not anymore. Why not? Not anymore. Now, those, I mean, I, once I did the, uh, it's swore wagon. You little bitch. <laughs> you little bitch. Oh, you that, little we bitch. Watched, we I'll watched. We watched. Call a, you a bitch. We watched a lot of movies in our house, Alec. Fuck. Lots of movies. Uh, that you when that one was you on. You a bitch. I like Warwick Wiggins. There's nothing <laughs> like a wagon for war. You remember what the plot was? It was a war. You could put stuff in it. It was impenetrable. No one could. Who directed it? Who directed in harm's way? Preminger? Preminger, yes. I saw that recently. Jesus, we're going back. I'm too young for this convo. Could I just insert while you keep looking here? Because this is just to embarrass yes. Alec. Alec was he's, in he's uh, incredibly Beetlejuice. philanthropic uh, <laughs> based on what I read in terms of really being incredibly generous with his money. Uh, so anyway, that's just something it's nice to say. Yeah, not that you. Well, you know, I would do shows. I did jobs, which the whole purpose of doing them were as reservoirs of money for my foundation. Like when I did Match Game, did I want to host a game show? No. I went in there and did the show. We did three seasons and they paid me a lot of money. They paid me so much fucking money. It was amazing. <laughs> I love hearing Put it in my foundation. Mm -hmm. put, me in the, put the money in the foundation. I did five years of Capital, Capital One, Bank, One credit card yes. prices. They paid me a lot of money over five years, a ton of money. Gave all that away. Did it on Amazon. I would always look for gigs like Amazon Alexa. They pay everything where they pay me are these gigs, and that goes into the foundation. And what is the and foundation's you, purpose? What's it named? For? Mostly What's arts for? related. I mean, we have yeah. some environmental, some alma mater. My wife and I both went to NYU, but predominantly it's arts. The Hampton Film Festival, New York Philharmonic, New York Philharmonic, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. uh, NYU Tisch, where I went to school. But the point is, is that, uh, but and, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming either one of you guys, you know, when you have a good time. It doesn't fucking matter. You can be ringing the bell with a bunch of guys and playing Santa Claus for the Salvation Army on the corner. If you're having fun, you're having fun. Mm -hmm. And I went to go do a, a match game, and some guy writes on the internet, he writes, the final nail. Oh, like it was Alec a money Baldwin's, play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the final nail in Alec Baldwin's career coffin. They write. And I went to do match game. Jen Mullen, who runs uh, um, uh, Fremantle, they were the producers. Uh, 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 and Scott, the other producer, all of them. I went to do Match Game. I had more fun doing a Match Game than you could possibly fucking. You know, we had a ball. Yeah. We had a ball. And it was like SNL. I mean, SNL is a different animal because it's much more. When I first did SNL, I'll never forget, like, you're kind of high. You're kind of, in, it's blurry. And then finally, uh, Adana, the dresser, grabs me and she throws me in the booth and she says, we got to get you dressed for good nights. And I go, what? <laughs> she goes, it's over. And I go, it's over? It went by like it was 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. It was such a blur. It, it was so blur. insane. And then so, but, but was, other than the, the intensity of that, uh, 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 match game, I had so much fuck. I can't find the match game. But, uh, we have people come. Uh, Horatio was my, I always say, with the edge of the, the, the dais, so three on top, three on the bottom, mm -hmm. and the two closest to me, they're my wingman. Caroline Ray. Horatio. I mean, I had people that were my wing. I mean, I could always throw to play them. off of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They, they, they'd always come up with something light and fun and, mm -hmm. and, and keep the ball in the air. You know what I mean? And I had, and then there were people on the show who were like, and we just made fun of them. They, they give us an answer and I'd be like, I don't want to name names, but you can just watch the show. And I look at them and be like, I, I, on the air, I go, you've got to be fucking kidding me. That's your answer? Are you fucking kidding me? I'm not looking yeah, we, would, we would just smack them. You know what I mean? But can't, aren't we living in the age where you can do anything? Like, I turned down a lot of commercials in the 90s because it was, you know, uh, wasn't considered, you're not supposed to do commercials. I mean, Jay Leno did Doritos, but other than that. But it seems like everyone does commercials. Everyone does game shows. Uh, every we're in the age of everyone does everything, and also people when talk I, about money a lot more and their brand and protecting their. When brand. I when yeah. I started in this business, you didn't sell you didn't sell alcohol. No, nope. you didn't sell alcohol. I, I I don't care if you live in a castle in the northern part of Italy. You didn't sell alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I, I no alcohol sales, no tobacco sales. Remember, they used to fly 
movie stars would fly. They paid you a million dollars yeah. for one day to fly to sell Suntory whiskey in Japan. You never yeah. sold anything yeah. in the States. Yeah. No alcohol, no tobacco, and all that kind of stuff. And now, uh, I mean, I, I did Capital One a long time when we were doing 30 Rock. And when you're on TV, they want you to be on TV more. You know, When you're on TV, you get invited to do every talk show. But when you're not on TV, you don't. So I got invited to do the Capital One thing when I was on 30 Rock. And uh, 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 I'm not saying I'm a pioneer. I'm not saying I'm like, you know, fucking Magellan here of uh, commercials for actors. But and now that the dam is broken, everybody does. Well, and they get their own everybody brand. They, they make their own tequila. It's huge. Booze, yeah, Hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars. Uh, you know, these, these actors becoming entrepreneurs in sort of multi hundred million dollar generational billion. Then there's people, then there's people who like, if you're not careful, you can't remember what it is they're selling because they're selling like Ryan Reynolds. Like, does he sell party balloons or does he sell? Does he sell? Or a, uh, a does he phone sell phone or phone cases? Brand, or a phone or brand muffins or what does he sell? I forget. He's, like, he's an entrepreneur. Blurry. He's just an entrepreneur. He's an entrepreneur. He just does. He he's just does everything. But um, the problem is, we're just we're just jealous. That's, yeah. That's, 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 well, did you? I'm just curious for a second. You being philanthropic at that level. Um, I, I don't know how much money you had at the time, but it seems, is this something from your childhood or being uh, raised Catholic or is it, is it a familial thing or where do you think this comes from? I've never, the numbers I've seen are just extremely generous, like extremely philanthropic. So, well, I mean, it was, it was, it was phil philanthropy becomes something you're addicted to and you can make a big mistake. Mm -hmm. I went to a philanthropy conference that Credit Suisse held because Credit Suisse was a huge underwriter of the Philharmonics and they invited and I went to this thing at a hotel here in New York, and it was in an evening. And I sat with all these guys. And the guy said, remember, philanthropy isn't about you giving me a million dollars this year. Mm -hmm. Philanthropy is about me be being able to make plans. You're going to give me $50,000 for the next 20 years. Right. I need, to be, I need a reliable reservoir, a reliable pipeline of money to make. I got to be able to make plans. Mm -hmm. So don't give me a big check once. Give me a nice check. For 20 years, so I can, and that's the mistake I made. We gave million dollar checks, mm. and, and I kind of got drunk on philanthropy. You know what I mean? Right. It's, it's a very, you kind of get high. Good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, let me tell you something, folks. My kids are going to come charging yeah. through the store any minute now. No, Alan, I got to go. Do you have, Go what, do you have any you're final right. statement? Anything further? I to, out? What does Alan want to say? My IV. <laughs> I want to say, um, I want to say, uh, uh, Dana. Um, uh, I owe you for my Trump. I totally stole your uh, Nagada. I totally stole that school of uh, impersonation. No, no, no. Make you don't know. You're, 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 you're Tony Bennett is one of the best pure impressions. You know, the only one that worked great was when he came on. Wasn't that fun? When I he watched came on? it today. Oh, and it was magic. When he came on. We cried. Well, he's we such cried. a likable character, and you guys he's were the, great. But that is he's, he's, he's it. That's he's a it. brilliant impression. And my last thing to Spade is uh, uh, thank you for not log rolling me. And I call you a bitch. Okay. Right, <laughs> no, I had a blast, dude. I love talking. Alec, to you. What, this what was one of the easiest podcasts I've ever done. I just love mm -hmm. listening to your stories. Great. Really, really fast. Thank you, you so guys. much, bud. Stay right. safe. Stay safe. Talk to Ciao. you soon. This has been a podcast presentation of Cadence 13. Please listen, then rate, review, and follow all episodes. Available now for free wherever you get your podcast. No joke, folks. Fly on the Wall has been a presentation of Cadence 13, executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Chris Corcoran of Cadence 13, and Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment. The show's lead producer is Greg Holtzman with production and engineering support from Serena Regan and Chris Basil of Cadence 13. 